Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. On this gloomy morning, we're going to be brightened up by hearing all the nice things that we're doing in this community for those in need. Before we do that, though, um, okay. I think there were a couple of announcements people wanted to make. Is, was there? Where's Tammy? Tammy? You want, okay. Hi, I put out um, information about, oh, thank you. Hi, Tammy Burks, the Associate Rector at St. Thomas and Maronick, and I put out on your tables um, information about our free concert. We're doing a free community concert to end our concert series. It's on um, Sunday, June 10th at 4 o'clock. Um, everybody is welcome. We're really pushing this in the community, so if you can also take a flyer and post it somewhere to spread the word. Uh, hi, this is Nancy Seligson, Supervisor of the Town of Maronick. I want to let everyone know that we're having a free compost give back day on Saturday, a continuation of what we did last Saturday. We have free nutrient rich compost that for those of you who have been participating in the food waste composting program, this is the give back, but it's open to all residents of the town of Maronick and village of Larchmont. Come down to the uh, Maxwell Avenue Recycling Center between 8 a.m. And uh, 11:45, bring a bucket on Saturday, on Saturday, this Saturday, and bring a bucket and get some great compost. You have to bring your own bucket. B Y O B. Okay, who else? And then for for everyone here today is the school budget vote. Um, so for people in Mamaroneck. It is the, you could go to your elementary schools from 7 to 9 for people in Rhineck. The vote is in the middle and high school library. And in Larchmont, it's Chatsworth School, correct? It's in, in, the, in the elementary school. Elementary school. Great. Every, every elementary school, you mean. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other announcements? Okay, I'm going to turn the program over to... <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Malcolm Froman. I, I first want to thank, uh, like to thank the folks who worked with me on putting together this panel, Tammy Burks, John Gitlich, and Rose Silvestro. As uh, some of you know, I'm involved with the Larchmont Mamaroneck Hunger Task Force. We run a food pantry in Mamaroneck, and every two weeks, we distribute food to over 350 households, which represent approximately 1,500 people, including four, over 400 children. And we're able to do this because we have dozens and dozens of volunteers who work selflessly to make this all happen. And we're able to distribute all this food with the funds that are donated by many residents uh, in Larchmine and Mamaroneck and, and, and other places as well. It's very gratifying to see the generosity of, of uh, the community. With the money that they donate, we're able to, uh, to provide, uh, of all the money that we receive, 90% of that, those donations goes directly to buying food. To those of us who are involved in the world of struggling families, it's dramatically clear that there are challenges often that go beyond having enough food. They may lack access to decent affordable housing and adequate health care. Our speakers and the organizations they represent are dedicated to helping those in need to meet those challenges. I've experienced firsthand the remarkable commitment that these folks demonstrate. And they understand that the support and the engagement of the community is essential. While we frame this program as the three H's, housing, health, and hunger, there's a fourth H, helping. Uh, along with telling you <coughs> about their respective missions, these experts will also talk about the various ways that all of us can get involved and help. I'd like to introduce our panel now. Teresa Collier <coughs> is the Community Service Coordinator for the Washingtonville Housing Alliance and West Hab. West Hab is the leading nonprofit provider of housing and social services for homeless and low-income families in Westchester County. 
The Washingtonville Housing Alliance was formed in 1980 to improve the housing conditions of low and moderate income residents in the Mamaroneck area. In her role at the Housing Alliance, Teresa is responsible for developing and launching programs that assist their tenants and the community at large with housing and security needs. Prior to her current position, Teresa was a psychiatric nurse at New York Presbyterian Hospital for over 18 years. She has also been a volunteer community organizer in Yonkers. Lindsay Farrell was appointed president and CEO of Open Door Family Medical Centers in 1998. Open Door describes its primary mission as keeping the people of Westchester and Putnam counties healthy and strong, regardless of their ability to pay. Just about a year ago, Open Door opened the doors of its family medical center in Mamaroneck. Lindsay is a member of the board of directors of MVP Health Plan in Schenectady and serves as secretary on the board of the Community Health Care Association of New York State. She is a graduate of St. Lawrence University, received her master's in business administration from the Lubin School of Business at Pace University, and is a fellow in the American College of Medical Practice Executives. As president and CEO, Leslie Gordon leads Fe Feeding Westchester in its mission to provide healthy food and eradicate hunger in Westchester County. Prior to joining Feeding Westchester, Leslie served as a key executive at City Harvest, where she led plans to improve food access and nutrition for 500,000 low-income New Yorkers. Earlier, she was the founding director of Made in the Hudson Valley and served under General Colin Powell as National Director of America's Promise, the Alliance for Youth. A fourth generation of resident of Tarrytown, Leslie is a graduate of SUNY New Paul's <laughs> with a degree in sociology. She's a frequent guest speaker at various organizations addressing hunger, including the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine on Seniors and Hunger. Jeanette Gisbert has been a volunteer with, has been with Volunteer New York for 10 years. Their core mission is to inspire, mobilize, and equip individuals and groups to take positive action to address pressing challenges, support nonprofits, and strengthen the quality in the community. As, de as Deputy Executive Director, Jeanette manages program strategy and cohesion. She also supports revenue generating specifically related to the corporate and government outreach. Prior to joining Volunteer New York, Jeanette worked with New York Cares as their first director of volunteer relations. She was responsible for the recruitment and management of thousands of volunteers and hundreds of volunteer leaders. Jeanette began her nonprofit career as an AmeriCorps VISTA member. She holds a BS in management from Boston College and a master's in public administration from CUNY Baru. After each of our panelists have had a chance to speak, there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers. Teresa. Good morning. Good morning. So my name is Teresa Collier. I'm the Community Service Coordinator for Washingtonville Housing Alliance, as Malcolm um, informed you. And I'm thrilled and honored to be here. Um, a little bit about what I do, as Malcolm said, is so that we really address the needs of housing issues, which, as one can imagine, are plentiful. Uh, Washingtonville currently has a portfolio of 40 rental units in, in Mamaroneck. Um, serving mostly low income, or really all low income um, residents here. And we also provide supportive services in addition to maintaining and, and owning the 40 units. As one can imagine, many factors affect housing um, needs. All of the funding that comes into Washingtonville Housing Alliance stays local within Mamaroneck and the Larchmont area. Um, but we do provide services to the, to the uh, greater area at, at large as well. Um, our organization is heavily dependent on volunteers and private donations from individuals and partnering agencies. And a lot of what we do also involves us partnering with other local agencies like the uh, Hunger Task Force, Opening Doors, Feeding Westchester, 
So um, basically what we do on a weekly basis is that we offer ESL classes. We have ESL classes on both Wednesdays and Thursdays at our offices, entirely run by two local community volunteers who are retired, who have done, who've worked in the Mamaroneck public school system for many, many years, and just wanted to share their passion of language with our community residents. Um, and again, completely volunteer basis. We partnered with another agency a couple of years ago when we did a couple of series of free yoga classes in partnership with St. Thomas Church, which is literally our backdoor neighbor. Um, and it was a free service opened up to the community and it really afforded people an opportunity to experience the yoga experience free. Um, and as you know, yoga classes can really be very, very expensive. Um, so those are just, we have a community resident who actually learned how to do jewelry making in her own country and just decided one day that she wanted to start teaching jewelry making to uh, some of the area residents. And weekly now, they're at the office from maybe 10 o'clock in the morning and they spend their lunch time and their afternoon and it's just a wonderful opportunity for them to sort of socialize, to learn a really great craft. They're now, if you see them out at public events on the avenue or all the fairs, they're out there selling their jewelry. So in addition, how it started out as sort of a social kind of a, a initiative has now sort of grown into a real possibility for these ladies to make some money, to increase their income, and all of those factors affect housing stability. Um, so that's a little bit about Washingtonville. What are some of the uh, housing uh, challenges that people you help? So, so I think the, the greatest um, housing challenge is just the lack of housing availability. Um, of course, Westchester County, as everyone knows, is one of the most, uh, is deemed to be one of the wealthiest counties in New York State. So I think that there's a false sense that everybody in this community can afford to be here. And that's not the truth. There's, there's a a significant amount of people who are in a lower income spectrum, and even those who may be in a, a lower middle income spectrum, who may be making fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, and you think they're kind of secure, they're living paycheck to paycheck, and at any given moment, it takes one incident in which they will fall behind. So what we, we what we're really proud of is that we do have a housing crisis fund that is completely funded by local donations. Um, and that enables us, to, when someone falls behind in their arrears, if someone falls behind in their utility payments due to a, a decrease in work hours or a, a, a uh, illness, um, we're able to really provide housing assistance for them to really secure their housing. If they encounter problems with landlords, are you able to help them? We do. So we have a full-time community service advocate who works out of our office Monday and this is exactly what she does. She steps in, she helps mediate issues between tenants and landlords. She does referrals, she helps with applications. Um, she helps with employment searches, apartment searches. Um, it is not just, it's not just for Washingtonville tenants, it's for the community at large. And actually most of the, the clients that we help are not our tenants. We only have, we ha only, but we have 40 apartment rentals. So actually, basically, most of our services is to the community at large. Yes. Uh, I didn't. Um, issues about Section 8 housing and resistance by landlords to Section 8 tenants, is that a problem? I, I, absolutely, and that's a problem across the board. That's not just here in Mamaroneck, and I think it's probably just a false sense of what Section 8 actually is that really prevents people from um, renting their units to Section 8 tenants. There is no only specific Section 8 apartments. Section 8 can be anywhere. Um, in a private house, in a building, um, and it really is just a guarantee for people, for landlords and property owners, if they take in a Section 8 tenant, that that Section 8 rent will be paid 
automatically. So it really is sort of like an extra security. The Section 8 tenants are really responsible for 30% of their income. So whatever their income is, they're only going to be responsible for 30% of that income, of, of that rent, and then Section 8 will pay the balance of, of that. Um, but absolutely, I think it's just a full sense of what Section 8 is that prevents people from renting their units to Section 8, and we just need to do a lot of education about Section 8, and that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> yeah. Are there many evictions, and is there a way of preventing people from being evicted? Yeah, you know, ev evictions are always um, problematic and really lend to insecurity for not only individual families, but that has a rippling effect when people are under the threat of eviction. Um, so again, we do have a community service advocate who will mediate between landlords and tenants and has really been really successful. Very often you just need that third person to come in and sort of work out a plan. Um, and I think there's other organizations that also offer that services and we work in partnership with those agencies as well. But again, when somebody falls behind rent in their rent, we do have that opportunity to help assist them with paying those arrears. And again, we don't do that by ourselves. We work with other local organizations. Because usually when people are behind in their rent, it's not just one month. When eviction proceedings have really usually been initiated, people are usually three, four, five months in arrears so that no one agency is able to really help pay all of that rent. So we do partner with other agencies to help get people up to speed and then work with the landlord to sometimes if there's a balance to work out a payment plan. Always the goal is to keep people in their apartments. Uh, we've had um, in, in between large and Maranac, we've lost, I don't know, maybe 60 un rental units mm -hmm. from fires in the last two years. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those actually were tenant landlords that accepted Section, Section 8. 8. And I don't, know, I don't know what the status on rehabbing those buildings are and the availability of units back to really both new and really long-term sure. community residents. Can you talk about that landscape? Yeah, I don't have the, I, the information about those specific buildings that suffered the damage and where they are in the process of rehabbing. I will say publicly that Washington Mill Housing Alliance is actively looking to build new affordable units. Um, so the issue is going to be we need to get support for that. People need to not be afraid of, of the, the term affordable housing. Really affordable housing really is just to enhance the community. You know, when you get a diverse um, group of people living together, it's a win-win for everybody. And I think just the, the, again, the stereotypes of low income and people afraid that it's going to bring down their property value, it's so not true. Really when you're integrating a diverse group of people, everybody wins. We are actively looking to build more affordable housing. Um, and the, you know, the issue is always where the zoning, you know, regulations sort of affect where we can also build those units, but yeah. Any other questions for Teresa? Volunteerism before I step. We are always looking for volunteers. If you have a passion, if you have a talent, if you have a gift, we have space available. We're always, it's again, the gentlemen that do the ESL classes in our office, I wish I should have just invited them to come to really just speak to their own testimony about how rewarding it is. And it really is not just about the people who volunteer just bringing a service. It really is about relationship building. And it really is about integrating communities and, and forming relationships. Um, so if you have any interest, any talents, any desire, um, reach out to Washingtonville Housing Alliance, myself, Teresa, or Bertha Gallo is the community service advocate. And let's, let's make things work. Let's make things happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Teresa. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Open Door was founded in 1972 as a free clinic in the basement of a Baptist church in the center of Ossining, where I live. I came to Open Door when my second child was born, so I know how long I've been there because my son is 32 years old. <laughs> I was a volunteer with the Junior League. I'd moved to the suburbs 
I was lonely, I needed friends, and I landed at the open door, and it was the most important experience of my life. Um, working as a volunteer in a healthcare organization is interesting. Back in the 1970s, Open Door actually utilized volunteer physicians and nurses, but it became very apparent back in the day that that model was not sufficient for meeting the needs of our patients. And so we have 55,000 patients that we serve all across Westchester and Putnam County. On the sound side of the county, we operate a very large facility in Port Chester. We have 25,000 square feet in Port Chester. We also have clinics in every school in Port Chester. And it became very apparent when we realized we had a thousand people coming to Port Chester from Mamaroneck that the need to locate a facility in Mamaroneck was indeed going to be important. And as Malcolm mentioned, we opened that facility last spring. It's very nice. I love driving by it because we've got a beautiful sign. It's on Mamaroneck Avenue, 689 Mamaroneck Avenue, very close to the Mamaroneck Avenue Elementary School. We have two physicians there. They're board certified family physicians. Dr. Daniela Diaz is our medical director. Um, she's an Ivy League graduate. She comes out of the Columbia Family Medicine Residency Program. She's bilingual, um, and we are really, really thrilled that she's chosen to practice in the Marinette because we certainly understand the needs of the community. We also have a social worker in Mamaroneck, um, as Teresa noted, we, we serve a, a very a poor clientele. Many of our patients have no health insurance whatsoever. Um, many of our patients receive their health coverage through Medicaid, which is a very important payer. And so Open Door is a $55 million organization. I wish I could tell you that um, philanthropy, you know, really drives that budget. It doesn't. We are very dependent upon policymakers in Washington and in New York State. And um, I get up every day and I'm very grateful that I work in New York State because policy decisions that are made in other parts of the country are really negatively impacting low-income people. In New York State, it's relatively easy to qualify for Medicaid benefits. If you're a child, it's very easy to um, be covered through New York State's Child Health Plus insurance program. If you're an adult and aren't um, with papers in the United States, it's a little bit tougher. But that's why we offer a sliding fee scale. And so typically, a medical visit will cost about $25. We offer a cash discount. And so if someone comes and can give us $20 at the time of service, we won't charge them the additional $5. Most people are indeed able to pay that. And with that $20, they're able to get some lab tests. If the physician is ordering additional lab tests, they will get a bill for additional lab tests, again, deeply discounted. And lastly, we have what we call a 340B. That's a government term for prescription benefits. And so as a federally qualified health center, we are able to purchase drugs at deep discounts. We have virtual inventories at participating pharmacies. We partner with Walgreens, for example. When our physicians write prescriptions, our patients can go to participating pharmacies and receive these um, medications at, at deeply discounted prices. Now, it's not as great as if you have health coverage, so we work very, very hard. We have on-site enrollers. We assess our patients. If they don't have benefits, we will work to try and get them benefits. If they aren't going to qualify for Medicaid or any other type of insurance, then they go on the sliding fee scale. Um, the social determinants of health really um, are the most significant impact on what drives a person's health. So it's wonderful that we're medical providers. It's wonderful that we have doctors. Oh, we also will be opening a dental program in um, Mamaroneck. In the summertime, we have our giant dental van um, that takes care of children in the Port Chester school system. It's huge. I get so excited when I see it driving on the highway because it's got these cute kids with toothbrushes on the side. Um, but we parked it there last summer, and it, and it really you know, provided an important benefit. We have dentists and hygienists 
actually on the dental van. And we will, once the state certifies us, which is a relatively long process, we will be offering dental services in our Mamaroneck location as well. I should also note that we're in Mamaroneck with a partnership with Westchester Medical Center. They have offices on the floor above us at 689 Mamaroneck Avenue, and they will be um, providing some specialty services, cardiology, for example, um, and I can't remember all of the other services that will come in eventually into that building. So that's a nice thing. When our physician wants to make a referral to a specialist, we'll have some services available on site. I should note that specialty care is really very challenging when you're poor. If you have Medicaid, there's a network of contracted specialists. So we work very hard to get people on Medicaid because then the doors will open in other physician offices. If you're uninsured, it becomes much more difficult. But again, through this partnership with Westchester Medical Center, um, they have academic clinics in Valhalla. And so we're able to send our patients to those clinics. Unfortunately, other hospitals don't have an academic component. And so it becomes much harder to access our specialty services. So I got to give kudos to Westchester Medical Center, even though it's a bit difficult to get there and the parking isn't all that easy, at least they're willing to see our patients. I should note that, you know, Open Door was founded because we realized that even though there were practicing physicians in the community, many physicians aren't able to care for low-income people because they don't have the right insurance or the doctor doesn't accept Medicaid. There are not a lot of doctors that will accept Medicaid. And so, you know, we become an advocate for trying to convince a physician to indeed see this patient. It's difficult at times because our patients sometimes have ch more challenging circumstances. They don't have transportation. Sometimes they can't get to the specialty appointment. We have some limited um, transportation services. Recently I learned about Uber Health. Um, Uber Health is Uber taking you to medical appointments and so boy if we can figure out a way to access some Uber, Uber Health services I think that will provide an important benefit to our patients because transportation is a significant barrier. I am so thrilled about Leslie Gordon and Feeding Westchester. Malcolm um, participated in what we call Fresh Direct um, in our Mamaroneck facility because we were really focusing on the social determinants of health. Obviously, housing and food and transportation are really, really, and education are really important in supporting vulnerable people in our communities. And so working in partnerships with other organizations has been really important. I want to call on Gina DeVito in the back who runs, she's a clinical nutritionist, the best, the best. Um, and she runs our wellness programs. In many of our facilities, we have nutritionists on site, and we also have yoga on site, and we have Zumba on site, and we have Tai Chi on site. We have exercise, we have an exercise scientist um, that we employ. And again, our physicians are becoming more focused on making referrals to these very important, rather than prescribing a pill, let's focus on diet, let's focus on physical activity. There's so many things that you can do to improve your health without a prescription. And, you know, why not encourage our, our clients to really think about those lifestyle choices before, you know, taking a pill to resolve whatever the, whatever the issue is. So that's a, a service that has been important. We do use volunteers in our wellness program, and, you know, volunteer yoga instructors, volunteer support staff. Um, and we also use volunteers in reading to children. We participate in the Reach Out and Read program. So our pediatricians prescribe a book, um, and we give out lots and lots of books. Free books are really important. The kids love them. And so we do book drives throughout the community. We do diaper <laughs> drives throughout the community. So there are many ways that volunteers can get involved. And I think I've talked enough. I have a question for yes. you. For those of us While we're <laughs> distributing uh, a selection of healthy food, it's clear, it's always clear to us that our clients, many of them, are just not eating in a healthful way. Uh, once they get beyond the food that we provide them, they're left to their own devices. And they're not eating properly. Many of them uh, are overweight. Uh, 
many of them uh, uh, are probably uh, having to deal with the possibility of diabetes. And the food pantry has tried different initiatives to educate them on about proper nutrition. I was wondering whether Open Door has made any initiatives in that direction. And Gina's right back there. Wave, Gina. Wave. Yes, it, it's really what we are. It's really what we are about. And so at Fresh Direct, we're giving out recipes. Gina's doing recess rocks with the kids, which is a physical activity program as, you know, the parents are picking up the food. Gina's, we've got volunteers on the side and the kids are, yes, we are all about educating our families so that they know what to do with the fresh produce that they're that they're receiving, and we have lots of resources available. Our dream, of course, is to have teaching kitchens in every facility, easier said than done. Space is very tight and very expensive in Westchester, but again, through partnerships with churches and what have you, that's certainly um, something that we're looking, looking forward to. But yes, um, education is really important. Gina does uh, supermarket tours, food. I mean, Gina, you can you should speak brief, briefly. I think it's um, it's so interesting. It's so interesting what Gina does. We have we have an, a lot. We have a lot of different food nutrition education based programs. Um, I could speak all day about them, but one thing that I do want to mention as well is that we do a lot of provider education. So we work with our doctors and our other healthcare professionals to make sure that they understand how to provide nutrition education to all of our patients because like Lindsay said, we only have so many dietitians to go around um, and it's there's a lot of people that need that education. Um, and food is really a sensitive thing to people. Food is culture. A lot of our immigrant population, you know, food is, is their whole life and it's what they take with them from home. So it's really important to have the right tools as an educator to understand how to meet people where they are and how to make appropriate changes that will keep them happy and keep their families feeling attached to their culture, but also make them healthier. So we do a lot of education, not just with the patients and the people in the community, but with the people who are giving that education across the board too. I should just, I should just add that our work in the Portchester schools is really where we're most effective um, by engaging children and their parents around healthy eating. And in the schools, we're able to be there all day, every day. So we can really have a significant impact when we're working with, ch with school children and their parents. And we look at, I mean, we have a, an amazing health information system. And so we look at body mass index of the children that we care for in the Portchester schools. And we have made a significant difference in childhood obesity. I'll also note in terms of pediatric oral health, again, we've got great data. And so by putting sealants on children's teeth, right, we can prevent a lifetime of decay. So it's all about prevention, prevention, prevention. And you can save, a, save taxpayers lots of money when you're able to work with low-income families in a preventive way very early on. Thank you. I just have a, a small addition to this, this wonderful comment about nutrition. Um, some of the churches and our, our wonderful Archmont Women's Club, Janet DeMacy's here, um, the importance of alerting those of us who bring the bags of food, which we do to every meeting of the Women's Club now, um, alerting them, Malcolm has helped us with this, low sugar cereals, the kinds of, we can make a real choice just in what we collect, both at the churches and groups like Women's Club, et cetera. So I'm just so glad to hear the extra nutrition. Uh, do you accept donations of like crutches or wheelchairs or things that people no longer need or, sometimes. or medications? No, medications, no. Um, sometimes, you know, depending, um, I wish I could say yes, but it's a little bit more complicated. Um, wheelchairs we need, um, but, it, but it just depends. So the best thing to do is to, is to call. You can go on our website and there's information on our website. We do, Alicia, yes, she's wonderful. Yes. Hi. Oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, has, has the change in immigration law uh, federally affected, uh, you know, people coming for services? Are less people coming for services? Are they afraid to, uh, you know, get services or apply for Medicaid? 
because of uh, immigration status? So we haven't seen a decline in medical activity. In Brewster, we've seen uh, it's been impacting our oral health um, program. I'm not really sure why. Maybe you know families are prioritizing medical over over dental, um, but we are very, very worried about what's ahead. There's a concern that politicians in Washington could um, use um, health center benefits as this public charge issue. So if you're receiving Medicaid, it could impact your immigration status. We're, we're, we're particularly worried about that, yes. Coming from the private insurance world, statistics are often kept. Do you keep statistics on utilization? What type of the, the, you know, the services and procedures? And we have so much data. I mean, we are so information rich. Yeah. <laughs> are they shared so that they can help contribute to the solutions? Absolutely. I mean, we have to write grants um, in order to demonstrate our effectiveness um, to Washington. We have to submit reports regularly. Um, and for New York State, we are in full risk contracts. Um, that You're not even seeing that in the commercial sector. So we're what's in what's known value-based payment arrangements. And so if utilization is excessive, if, if there's churning, you know, we're at risk and we will lose money. So what policymakers have done, particularly on the Medicaid side, because it's funded with tax dollars, is they've said, you're at risk, and so you better manage health care appropriately. So thank goodness we're data rich, because what we're doing now is we're really focusing on our most at-risk clients. Um, we have patient advocates and patient navigators, and mental health professionals. We have psychiatrists on staff as well. And so we are focusing on high-risk patients and trying to deliver lots of services to keep them out of the emergency room and out of the hospital where the expenses, you know, become significant. So we have a very robust care management program um, that we continue to enrich every single year. Thank you. <laughs> I'll let Lindsay get seated next to me. She gets comfortable. Um, so good morning, my name is Leslie Gordon. I have the honor and pleasure of leading our food bank here in Westchester County. I'm really honored to be joining you in this forum this morning and really pleased that Malcolm extended the invitation to me and, and frankly delighted to be in the company of my esteemed colleagues and frankly organizations with whom we have an opportunity to partner on a reasonably regular basis. Um, we're now feeding Westchester, so for those of us, for those of you who were familiar with our former branding, we were the food bank for Westchester. We did a rebranding exercise this past spring, and our new official name is Feeding Westchester. Uh, it more actively tells you not just who we are, but uh, in a moment's notice tells you what we do, and that is we feed people. We've been in the marketplace for about 30 years, and our mission in totality is to end hunger. I need five people to raise your hands. Five people? Any five? Got one? Oh, more than five. All right. Um, so one in five residents, one in five of your neighbors here in Westchester County struggles to have enough to eat on a regular basis. And of course, here we are at the wonderful Nautilus Diner and, and anchor and uh, historic member of the community. But there are folks, uh, your neighbors, who won't eat breakfast this morning. Uh, they won't know if they'll eat lunch today. They'll go home this evening and they'll, they'll ration food in their household. They'll water down drinks and, and other food just to have some measure of nutrition in their diets. It's worse for kids in this county. It's actually, the statistic is startling. It's one in three children in this county don't have enough to eat. So it's our kids, it's seniors on limited incomes, it's the underemployed, it's the unemployed. And so at Feeding Westchester, we source good nutritious food, we inspect it, we store it, we distribute it uh, almost every day of the week. This year, we're on pace to distribute an astounding nearly 8 million pounds of good nutritious food to almost every town here in Westchester, including the Larchmont-Mamaroneck area, of course. So we're really pleased to have in our 
network of partners, the Larchmont Mamaroneck Hunger Task Force and all the good work that Malcolm and some of your uh, food pantry folks in the room participate in. Our trucks cross the highways and byways. Um, they're distributing whole grains, proteins, uh, poultry, dairy, uh, everything that you need, the representation of, of all the five food groups. We're at the heart of a network of nearly 300 partners across the county who help us get food direct to people. So it's food pantries, soup kitchens, shelters, senior centers, housing complexes. And you heard some of my colleagues this morning share how costly it is to, to live in Westchester County, right? Uh, I'm a fourth generation resident, as you heard earlier, and I spent some time in New York City when I started my tenure at Feeding Westchester, now going about back about 16 months, give or take, the most common response I got in early conversations going about the county was, really? Westchester? My neighbors are hungry in Westchester? And so here's another startling statistic. For a family of four to meet basic needs in Westchester County, they need to earn about $90,000 a year. And there's a fair number of our neighbors who are not at that income bracket. And that's just to cover basic costs, right? So that rent, maybe gas in the car, some food for your family. That doesn't cover any uh, of the unpredictables, emergencies, or any excess. New shoes for your kids, maybe they want to play soccer, so you have a hard time playing, buying cleats, whatever it is. So it's obvious, right? This is a very serious problem. And it's also about malnutrition. So I'm looking at Gina in the back of the room and, of course, in company of others. <laughs> Outside of the food that uh, your neighbors receive at our cohort of partners and through direct distributions that we do, uh, we also have a fabulous vehicle. It may not be as cute with the kids and the toothbrushes, um, but we have a roving vehicle that's our mobile food pantry. It roams around the county and... Uh, T sets up shop in large parking lots and distributes within the span of two hours to nearly 200 households, so that could be as much as a thousand people or more, about between 6,000 and 10,000 pounds of, of good nutritious food. But outside of that, in our food system, there is a reality, and that is, is that unfortunately the cheapest foods in our food system are consistently laden with fat, sugar, and salt. And they temporarily help you to feel full, but they tend to cause these deleterious effects on your overall health as a person. And so what transpires is that you find yourself laden with diet-related diseases like diabetes and hypertension and cardiovascular disease, among some others. Um, and so that's why, for example, we're really pleased to partner with Open Door and, and other health providers, and we'll continue to do more of that as, as time moves on. Um, you know, for example, if kids don't grow healthfully, the statistics are startling there as well. If you don't have the good nutrition that you need as a young child, the statistics are that as you grow into adulthood, you're much more likely to be an unhealthy adult. Um, and we all bear the costs of that. The savings are really impressive when we're able to give kids and frankly adults all the resources that they need to thrive and live healthy lives. But kids can't be productive in school, right? I mean, I know, for example, that if I don't eat lunch and I'm a very sort of regimented eater, so if I don't eat by 12 noon or one o'clock, you don't want to come talk to me. Right, but imagine if I'm a kid in school and I haven't had breakfast that morning or I don't have access to lunch that day, what it must be like for me in the classroom environment or for an adult. Right, so picture this scenario. You're, you're a mom, you're not eating well yourself, you've got diet-related disease issues, you're unhealthy, you're missing work, so you miss wages, your kids aren't concentrating in school, so you've got added levels of stress, which adds to mental illness. It's just a, it's a downward spiral. At Feeding Westchester, I want to let you know that we tackle hunger from all angles. So we are not just about providing folks with access to good, nutritious food. We have a registered dietitian on staff, Denise Tatosian, who's fantastic. Uh, and Kleana, who is her partner in crime, has a master's in nutrition. They rove about the county and teach free nutrition education workshops. There are a hands-on cooking and nutrition education class that help to build the knowledge, confidence, and skills 
to shop well on a limited budget. So we do some activities um, for which I'm a little bit delinquent. I probably should be doing some similar things myself, but they take out the circular for the supermarket and they look at you know, what's on sale this given week that's, you know, healthy and how do you make a, a healthy meal for your household based upon, you know, what your budget will allow, but also what's on sale. It's an evidence-based curriculum that's been proven and tested. It's called Just Say Yes to Fruits and Vegetables. Um, so we're really super excited about that. We also have a, a gal who roams throughout the county helping seniors and the disabled in particular uh, qualify for and then enroll in SNAP. It's formerly called food stamps. And so, you know, there are some dignity challenges, particularly with our older Americans. A lot of folks don't want to tap into the resources that are available to them. And we try and make it comfortable and easy for them to partake in those benefits that are available to them. This is an important piece that I'd like you to pay attention to this morning. Because in the advocacy realm, there is a lot going on on Capitol Hill around SNAP benefits and overall nutrition that could have a really significant and very unfortunate impact on our neighbors. There is something called the Farm Bill. It comes up for reauthorization on Capitol Hill every five years. This is the year, my friends, and is the Federal Nutrition Bill. The proposed cuts to this bill it's something that I've not seen in the well over a decade that I've had the pleasure of serving others around hunger. There are billions of dollars of cuts that are proposed to SNAP, again, formerly called Food Stamps, WIC, Women, Infants, and Children Program, and other nutrition bills that roll along with that. And so I'm asking you in advance to continue to, to pay attention to that and reach out to our local legislators to let them know that it is absolutely critical that that support continues for our neighbors. Because if it doesn't, and we see a substantial backslide in resources, um, it'll impact all of us that you see on the panel today and, and also our communities. So for example, the statistics tell us that for every dollar of SNAP that's spent in the communities, the actual return to our retailers where they redeem those SNAP dollars is about $1.73 to $1.75. So it's not just about the recipients, it's also about the retailers who receive these SNAP dollars. Uh, so we also have a farm. Did you know that we grow food at Feeding Westchester? So for all of you farmers out there, and all of the excited composters, <laughs> this, is the, this is a perfect time of year for you. Um, so we have the pleasure of having uh, one to two acre farm sites throughout the county. We partner with wonderful organizations like Leak and Watts, uh, the County Jail, the Ronald McDonald House, the School for the Deaf, the Westchester Land Trust, uh, among some other partners. And we have a master agriculturalist on staff. We lovingly call him Farmer Doug. He's excellent. And so if you're interested in getting your hands dirty, we love volunteers for that endeavor. Come out, help us weed, help us plant, um, help us cultivate. And the beneficiaries of the food that grows at those farm sites are kids in those programs or adults in those programs and whatever excess that they spin off comes right back to feeding Westchester and immediately on trucks and out to people. If you haven't visited us for a little bit of inside baseball, there really is a, a what I like to think is a very magical back-end logistics operation that powers our ability to be able to feed people in this county. So come visit our nearly 30,000 square foot distribution center facility. Take a ride on one of our trucks to see how things actually take shape across the county. Uh, we need help to repack food. So one of the things is we are largely privately funded. And so we count on donors like you that help us turn every dollar into about four meals in the county. We have a uh, ability to source things with great expertise. We actually have a chef who's our food sourcer on staff, Bob Sylvia. Uh, and so we buy food in bulk, not always, but sometimes, and we need volunteers in groups to come and help us repack that food into smaller household, household size amounts that eventually makes it, for example, to uh, Malcolm and crew at Larchmont Momarinac Hunger Task Force. We are supported by nearly 10,000 volunteers annually, so it's individuals, faith-based institutions, corporate groups, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, you name it. But please come visit us. Uh, and now I'm going to give an opportunity for a couple questions.
sure. Here it comes. Um, do you partner at all with any of the restaurants, like in the city, that second harvest thing? Yeah, um, so City Harvest, my wonderful former employer, um, you know, the thing is, is that they're in an urban environment. And so it's about efficiency and it makes sense, right? There's restaurants, like several of them on every block and they can stop every so often. Um, it actually makes up, believe it or not, although they're well known for us, an exceedingly small portion of the overall amount of food that they distribute. I get that question often. Here in Westchester County, it really isn't efficient. Restaurants tend to spin off very little excess, believe it or not. The largest generators of excess within this food system are uh, larger retailers like Stop and Shop, Acme, ShopRite, BJ's, wholesalers, farm systems, and post-consumer waste. Um, in fact, interestingly enough, 40% of the food that's produced in the United States goes to waste. Just take that in for a minute. So we actually technically, not even technically, it's a real thing, we have enough food in this country to feed everyone all the good nutrition that they need. And at Feeding Westchester, this may interest you, we actually rescue and recover good excess food that would otherwise find itself in a landfill. So this year we're on pace to rescue nearly 3 million pounds of good nutritious food or more from nearly 80 retail partners in the county. So we're Johnny on the spot, we're a reliable partner that retailers count on to take the excess away for a whole host of different reasons. For example, in their produce departments they spin off excess because as American consumers we're a little bit picky. I'm in that camp too. So if you go to a supermarket on a Sunday, right, after everything and the produce department's been a little bit beaten up and turned over, you see what people leave behind, but it's perfectly fine, right? If there's like a blemish, not the right size, not the right color that we've been acculturated and accustomed to. Um, so we're at, again, Acme, ShopRite, Stop and Shop, BJ's, Costco, Walmart, Target we pick up from. Uh, and every day of the week, uh, we're down at the world's largest wholesale produce terminal in the South Bronx at Hunts Point, picking up truckloads of good fresh produce that very literally would go into a landfill. And by the way, is the largest producer of methane gas. So at once, we say what we do is good for people and good for the planet. Yes. Oh, sorry. Is there one of, is one of your farms close to here? Or what, what is the closest farm close to here? I'd have to look that up for you. But what I'm going to ask you to do is um, come see me after. I'm going to give you one of my cards, okay. and I'm going to find out. Thank you, because we do have an active composting, food composting program sure. in our community, and maybe we could participate. It's a perfect time of year for that. Yeah. Let's hold off on Good morning, everybody. Again, my name is Jeanette Gisbert. I'm the Deputy Executive Director at Volunteer New York, and I just want to echo my fellow panelists' um, appreciation for and gratitude for the invitation this morning. I'm always uh, thrilled to be able to talk to new friends about the power of volunteerism. And for me, volunteerism um, is an incredibly important strategy to building the kinds of communities that we all want to live and be a part of. And I think you heard this morning about uh, the community needs that we have. I often, um, like Leslie, have to spend a little bit of time talking about why people should volunteer in our community. We don't have any community needs, and so we don't really know why we should volunteer. Um, and so I think what you've heard today is that's not true. Uh, there are hunger needs. There are access to health care needs. There are housing needs. Um, in addition to the information about how much it costs to live in this county, um, I might also add that uh, there is an incredible uh, income and equality issue in our county. It's actually one of the largest in this country. Um, and I wish I had checked, gotten that statistic before I came, but um, I'm also happy to circulate that. And so there is a growing group of unfortunately kind of haves and have nots in our community um, and that is why I think volunteerism is such an important uh, again strategy to play in um, in supporting our communities the other thing I, I might also also add is um, we have a, we have lots of evil plans at volunteer New York um, well 
I have lots of evil plans at Volunteer New York. Um, and one of them is uh, we all know that volunteerism helps the organizations that the volunteers go to um, and support in support of their mission. But the evil secret that we talk about at Volunteer New York are the individual benefits of someone that raises their hand and says, yes, I want to give back. Because we know that you're not only giving your time and your talents and your treasures, but you're building relationships, as Teresa said, and you're building a connected community. And connected communities are ultimately stronger and more resilient um, and able to withstand all kinds of disasters, whether they be natural disasters, um, which I know unfortunately Mamaronek and Larchmont has quite, have quite a, a history of, of dealing with, um, but also um, other tragedies that affect communities. Um, and so one of our evil plans is we'd love doctors to prescribe volunteering. Um, and so in addition to having a book or you know, making some better choices about making better food choices, get out there and volunteer. And Volunteer New York can help you find that opportunity. And that's what Volunteer New York does. Volunteer New York has been in the business of inspiring and mobilizing people to get out into the community uh, to volunteer for over 67, almost 68 years. We do that in a variety of ways. At the core of what we do is an online database. So think about it as an open table for volunteer opportunities. You want to do some volunteer work. You're not exactly sure where to get started. Come to volunteernewyork.org and we can help you find that opportunity. You can search opportunities by causes. You can search it by uh, geography. You can search it by time commitment. You can search by age, um, kind of whatever filter you are thinking about, um, we can help you find an opportunity through our database. We also have two community-wide action days where we leverage the relationships that we have with hundreds of local nonprofit organizations, help them identify what volunteers might be able to do in a day, organize big community days um, around 9-11, which is a national day of service and remembrance, and Martin Luther King Day, which is also a national call to action, and invite the community to participate. Um, we have a program, an RSVP program, which is a national service program for folks 55 and over. We sponsor that in Westchester. Our service territories are actually Westchester, Putnam, and Rockland. Um, we've done most of our work in Westchester for the last 67 years, but we've been asked over the years to uh, spread a little bit, and so uh, are partnering with organizations in Putnam and Rockland as well. But in Westchester, uh, we're the Westchester RSVP sponsor. One of the reasons why we're out there doing this work is uh, several years ago, Siena College did a landscape survey of the state of volunteerism in New York State. And one of the reasons, the, the, the biggest reason people said they don't volunteer is because nobody asks them. And so Volunteer New York is in the business of asking. We ask you every day to raise your hand, to get connected to us, to reach out so that we can help you find a way to give back to the communities because as you've heard, there are tremendous needs. Um, and so one of the things I did quickly, I know my, my time is running out and people are eating breakfast, but I, try, I went into our database yesterday and I tried to find volunteer opportunities that were connected to all of the issue areas that we talked about. And so just, you know, and this was like quick two second search. So don't quote me on like on any of these things. Um, but you can come to Volunteer New York, you can create a profile, uh, you can register to receive our e-newsletter that goes out twice a month, which is a curated list of the volunteer opportunities that we have in our database. Um, but just to give you an example, um, uh, Meals on Wheels in Rockland are looking for drivers, the Harrison Food Pantry is looking for people to deliver food to homebound seniors, um, the Shiloh Baptist Church in New Rochelle needs help with their food distribution, um, and maybe you want to make an impact on the issue of hunger, but you're not so interested in distributing food. Um, Life Progressive Services in Mount Vernon is looking for someone to help them with their website and to help get their social media efforts out. Um, we talked a lot about health and the issue of transportation. So I will say that that is probably one of the most 
uh, asked requests that we get from some of our nonprofit partners. And there are organizations like Ride Connect, like at home uh, at Somers, who are looking for volunteer drivers. Um, don't be afraid about having somebody in your car. They can talk to you about the different trainings uh, and opportunities, but drivers getting individuals to medical appointments, to supermarkets, a huge need in our county. Um, the, uh, the NAMI is having a mental health walk on Saturday if you need walk volunteers, um, and they also need volunteers to take pictures. Um, the equestrian uh, therapy volunteers for individuals with special needs uh, needs uh, volunteers. Um, and there are various local gift shops at hospitals that need volunteers. Um, and then also regarding housing, the Housing Action Council needs a social media volunteer. Caring for the Homeless of Peekskill has many programs that support um, those struggling with homelessness in that area. And um, the IFCA Housing Network is looking for volunteers to lead financial literacy workshops. So wherever your skills, whatever your strengths, there is a way to make a difference. I have a feeling that I'm already pre preaching to the converted. I'm sure that there are a lot of folks here that are already doing this volunteer work. But invite a friend, do more, um, and thank you for the opportunity. You really need a microphone, please? <laughs> Good morning. Uh, thank you, panel, for the excellent presentation. My question is regard to volunteers. As you know, uh, our, you alluded to the fact that our, our area had been devastated uh, by certain disasters. What is the distinction between volunteers in New York and AmeriCorps VISTA? You know, the President Kennedy's initiative, Volunteers in Service to America. What is the distinction? Because AmeriCorps was in this area, they've been in this area like four or five times, conjunction with Habitat for Humanity. So, and that was the, the only uh, correlation that I saw. Yep. Um, so that's a great question. Um, and as an AmeriCorps VISTA alum, I love to talk about AmeriCorps. It's like my favorite topic. Um, so AmeriCorps is a national service program. There's actually a federal agency called the Corporation for National and Community Service, CNCS. Think about it as the IRS for volunteerism. Maybe better than the IRS, but it's like a federal agency. CNCS administers several national service programs. One is AmeriCorps, the other is Senior Corps. And that's actually where RSVP comes from. Um, the other program in Senior Corps are Foster Grandparents, is the Foster Grandparents program, which also have, uh, exists in Westchester. AmeriCorps has different branches. You've got VISTA, which are about capacity building. You've got direct service, where you've got people who are out in the community reading to kids. Actually, I believe Open Door still has an, Amer an AmeriCorps team. Yep. Um, that work directly with youth in schools, if I remember correctly, and also through your open, through your book program. Yeah, and your wellness program. Um, and then there's the NCCC team of AmeriCorps, which is this um, mini army of 12, I think, crazy young kids who travel across the country being deployed to various disasters. And when they're not be deployed, they live out on like a, an army base. That was really not my jam. I'm like, I'm not living in an army base. It's not happening. Um, but so AmeriCorps, you join AmeriCorps. It's like the Peace Corps. You join AmeriCorps for a year, and you devote a year of service uh, in service to America. Um, and P.S., I think everyone should do it. Um, I think that it should be, and there's actually a movement to make national service a requirement, because um, I, I think there's tremendous personal uh, and community value to that. Volunteer New York is a local nonprofit organization. Our mission is to inspire people to volunteer locally 365 days a year. We're actually part of a global initiative called Points of Light, um, the Points of Light Institute, um, and we are also part of a network of 250 affiliates across the country that are trying to make it easier for people to volunteer locally. But we're a nonprofit organization, and AmeriCorps are, is a federal kind of government program. 
Um, hi, my name is Tina. I'm actually the president of Larchmont Friends of the Family. And what we do is what Leslie was talking about, which is that we help families in those kind of emergency situations by providing financial support to families with dependent children who are where when either a parent or child passes away suddenly or becomes very ill. My question for all of you is, in the last, you know, we've recently, we've expanded our reach. We serve families in Mimaranek, many of whom live below the poverty line. We had a mother recently who was very sick, um, couldn't afford her bandages. She had a terrible skin condition. She was uninsured, undocumented food insecure, um, living with no bed to sleep in with her four children in a one-bedroom apartment. It was a horrific situation. We were able to provide them with short-term financial assistance, but my question for all of you is how do we integrate your services? Because this, there are many families in this town who need all of them, and I just will add that we brought them $250 of groceries, and I called her on Monday to make sure she got them, and she said, oh yeah, but they all went bad because they were also six months behind on their electric bill. and the." the so we are doing so much. We are a small organization that gave out $80,000 in aid last year to our community. How do we help integrate these services to sort of get everything streamlined? It's, <clears throat> pardon me, it's such a fantastic question. And it's, it's, it's one of those things that actually keeps me up at night. Um, and, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm a little short, right? Height challenged. Um, it, it's, it's, again, one of those things that keeps me up at night. I suspect that is the case for my colleagues as well. Um, I, I believe that as leaders of uh, nonprofit organizations that provide social service resources and other supports, we have a responsibility to leverage, network, and connect what each of us provide. We no longer live in an environment where we can work separately and and nor should we and so so the good news story is is that in fact at this table i can tell you that um at least from our perspective we happily um, network and work directly with each and every one of these organizations on a lo and i'm interested to hear from my partners here on a local level something we're starting to think about for example is is creating uh one-stop situations because if you go through the Department of Social Services, it's frustrating. You get mired in all kinds of, of paperwork. It's not necessarily the most empathetic place, and I'm not trying to be overly pejorative about the work that those folks do, because it's, it's overwhelming what they need to tackle. Um, but we're starting to think of one-stop places. So for example, at a food pantry or, or at a soup kitchen, um, food is the carrot that brings people in. But if we could start to plug in uh, housing providers, medical providers, um, and, and other folks into that system, and even opportunities for folks who are lacking resources to volunteer, because um, it's a way to feel whole again. It's a way to, to feel like you still have an opportunity to give back and, and say thank you. Um, so it's definitely something we're thinking about, about how can we be a convener and a catalyst and mobilizing force to bring together those resources because we have a network where we can start to plug them in. And so start to look for that, and I'm happy to, to keep you updated on the progress of that work. Um, it, it's not fantastic. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. Um, so the situation is not atypical, and it's why we exist. Um, and so we have social workers on staff as well as advocates. So it's absolutely what we do um, routinely. And so I'm happy to help you connect with our, with our staff in Mimaranek. I'm afraid we've run out of time. As a result of my <coughs> work at the food pantry, I get a lot of gratification. I get gratification first and foremost seeing firsthand <clears throat> how we're helping people. And the best part of my day at the food pantry is when one of our clients comes up and says, thank you, God bless you for helping my family. I also get a lot of gratification from seeing the tireless volunteers that we have. That we're, we couldn't do what we we're doing without them. And, and also I get a lot of gratification from the, ge the clear generosity of our community. I told you that we, uh, we rely almost wholly on private donations from residents in our communities. But it occurred to me this morning that uh, there's another sense of gratification that 
I get from my involvement in all of this, and that is the opportunity to meet and work with extraordinary people like the four women you see sitting here. So I'd like you to join me in thanking them for a wonderful, wonderful program. Thank you, Malcolm, and I also want to thank our wonderful panel this morning. I also want to announce that this is the last meeting of the local summit for this season. We will resume next uh, September. We're not going to have a, a June meeting this year. This will be the end. Uh, we think we've ended on a very high note indeed, uh, encouraging everyone here to get involved with our community. That's why the local summit is here, to encourage uh, community participation and involvement and uh, to be an informed community about all these things. We feel we've made our contribution through the kinds of meetings we've been having all year. We hope to resume next fall. We thank you all for coming to this one and have a wonderful summer. And thank you all. Thank you.